Thank you for the intro, and uh, nice to be here in Texas. Um, I would have preferred my luggage arriving with me, but you, you may do. I borrowed a tie from a friend, um, so we're good to go. So, <clears throat> um, superheroes have secret origin stories. I'm not a superhero, um, but the closest I have to an origin story I think would be this one, so I'll share it with you, and you can just footnote it. So just keep it up on the blackboard, because I think this story will help explain a lot of the stories that follow. When I was about 10, thereabouts, maybe 12. Uh, I was living in Philadelphia, going to day school, um, and I'd wear my beanie on my head, and I convinced my mother that I was old enough and mature enough to take my next two younger siblings, I'm the oldest of eight, uh, to the local 7-Eleven. So she agreed, we went over the route, which was pretty straightforward, and she gave us you know, whatever it was, I don't know, a dollar at the time to buy three Slurpees, and we set off on our way to 7-Eleven, and we made it there, and we made it back with the three Slurpees. And my mother said, how did it go? And I said, it was great, you know, it's fine. And my sister, anybody who has a younger sister will you recognize this type of situation, uh, you know, says, you know, tell her about the, the, the kids. Shut up. So my mother says, what kids? Okay, what happened was along the way, some neighborhood teenagers decided that it would be funny to start like yelling stuff at us that apparently, you know, we were able to, to divine. Uh, was related to the fact that we were wearing, my brother and I were wearing yarmulkes on our heads. So they were, you know, taunting us. So we had just kind of, you know, quickened our pace and scurried along. So um, I said, to, so my mother said, well, what do you mean? What were they doing? I said, you know, they were yelling stuff at us and they were throwing pennies at us. Um, and I said, just, which I didn't get. Like, why would they throw pennies at us? So my mother had a weird look on her face that I hadn't seen before. And she said, well, you know, a lot of times people will say the Jews are cheap. So that's their way of shelling us. They throw pennies at them. So I didn't tell this to my mother. Maybe I told it to her years and years later. I think she heard me giving a talk where I told her the story. She said, you never told me that. What I didn't tell her was that, I don't know if it's because I'm from Philly, I don't know if it's because of my dad, but I have that type of personality where when somebody starts up with me, you know, my typical reaction is, oh yeah? Or, wanna go right now? Which I say to my younger boys, my older boys are bigger than I am now, so I don't say that any longer. Um, so the problem was that here I was 10, 11, 12 years old. There were three teenagers. So if I had said, oh yeah, wanna go right now? They would've just beaten my head into the ground. So there's nothing I could do. So the way that I figured out on the spot that I was gonna get them was, I picked up the pennies and I put them in my pocket, okay? So now I understood, when my mother explained to me why they were throwing the pennies, now I understood why they were laughing even harder when I, because look at, look at the cheap juice picking up the pennies. So that always stayed with me. As I got further along in my career, thankfully the pennies turned into dollars and then larger amounts of dollars. But I'm always cognizant of the fact that I'm still that Jew who's walking around. I'm that Jew who's signing up the new case, and I'm that Jew who's walking into court in front of defense attorneys, you know, adversaries, colleagues, fellow plaintiffs' attorneys, judges, adjusters, clients, and the like. So I wanted to share with you some stories and some thoughts about what it's like to be visibly Jewish in the workplace, because I'm a lawyer, I have to define terms. Visibly Jewish could mean a yarmulke on your head. It can mean for a woman dressing modestly. It can mean for a man or a woman telling your employer or your colleague that you have to leave early because it's Friday afternoon. In the winter for me, I don't know what time it gets dark here, but in the winter for me in New York, I have to leave about two o'clock in order to make it home in time to get ready for Shabbos. I mean, it could mean leaving early before a holiday. It could mean telling a colleague or a superior, even more difficult, I can't do that. Why can't you do that? It's unethical. And I answer to a higher authority the old Hebrew national commercial. So it could mean a lot of different things. So the first time that I felt that potential discord, or that, use a fancier word, dialectic, or let's say friction or conflict between my career path and my Judaism was my first day, first class at Harvard Law School. So just to set the scene, I had finished at Columbia, I had gotten into Harvard, at the time, having grown up and gone through day school, I hadn't been turned off of Judaism, thank God, but I hadn't been turned on. It just, that's what I did. You know, I wore my yarmulke and I kept kosher, but I didn't know the reasoning for a lot of the things I did. So when I, after I got out of law school, I said, you know, I'm still young. I skipped a couple grades. 
I'm going to give my Judaism one more shot because the things that I am doing, I probably should figure out why I'm doing them so I can hold an intelligent conversation when people ask me, like, why do you wear yarmulke? Why do you keep kosher? And the things that I'm not doing, maybe I should be doing. So I'm going to go check it out. So I wandered into a place called Or Samath in Israel. First time I was ever treated like a big boy and allowed to make my own decisions. And they gave me explanations, and some I liked and some I didn't. But I got more serious about my Judaism. I ended up deferring for a second year and then came back, got engaged to, and then married to a young woman that I had met um, early on while I was uh, in college at Columbia. And um, so after two years at Or Samath, came back and got married and then went up to, uh, to Boston to Cambridge and began my law school career. So I walk in on the first day little you know, fish out of water because I had been the last couple of years studying the Talmud, which yes, is good preparation for law school because they teach you how to argue both sides. On the other hand, sitting in the Talmud class, learning, studying the Talmud in Aramaic, you know, is, is a little different than coming straight out of college, which the other people were. So I'm gonna, you know, I have to get back into my secular career. So Professor David Wilkins walks into the room and he says to the assembled class, me and my fellow classmates, he says, welcome to Harvard, Harvard Law School. How many of you have seen the movie Paper Chase? Every single hand in the room goes up. He says, how many of you have read the book 1L? Every hand in the room goes on. Paper Chase, you may remember, was a famous movie, later became a TV series, about Professor Kingsfield, who was a Harvard Law School professor with a British accent, who would torture students. And of course, people would tune in, it was very popular, because we like watching other people get humiliated. He'd call on somebody, and by the time he was done, it was like a puddle where the Wicked Witch at West used to be. 1L, similarly, was Scott Turow's first book, he later became famous writing legal thrillers, but his first book is a true and non-fiction account of his 1L year, his first year as a law student at Harvard Law School, where the professor would walk in and would often greet the students immediately in their first class through this beautiful, heartwarming exercise. He would walk up to, to three people sitting next to each other, and he would say, each of you, look to your right, look to your left. He says, I want you to look at each other because within the next three years, only one of you is going to make it to graduation because two-thirds would fail out. He says, I want everyone to know there may well have been a time when it was like that here, but it no longer is. We're not here to intimidate you. We're not here to humiliate you. We're not here to embarrass you. We're not going to do any of those things. We're going to educate you. At times, we may even entertain you. So I want everyone to take a deep breath and just relax. And you can like feel in the room like, Okay, that sounds good. That sounds less intimidating you know, than, than what I was prepared for. Great. He says, however, we are going to use the Socratic method. It's named after Socrates, the famous Greek philosopher. I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to call on a guinea pig. I mean, a volunteer to answer. I'm going to ask another question, question and answer. And I'm thinking, I think the rabbis invented that system, but I'm not going to say anything. Fine, Socrates, great Socratic method. He's okay. Let's begin your legal education. Now, in college, the first day, you may remember, those of you at the college, it's a meet and greet. Professor comes in, asks you what you did over the summer, tells you about his or her, you know, the, the syllabus, his or her, you know, personal, you know, peccadillos or idiosyncrasies or hobbies, etc. You don't really accomplish much in the way of, of uh, everybody, you know, you know, introduces themselves. No heavy lifting on your first day in college. First day in law school is totally different. Your first day in law school, you've already been assigned readings, 50, 60, 70 pages worth of dense cases that you're looking at for most of the students for the first time, and. You're meant to analyze them, brief them, digest them, and be ready to answer specific questions about them. You're on, first day. He says, okay, let's begin. So I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to be the first guy called on. You know, I've been in Yeshiva the last two years. Let somebody else be the first guy called on. There was a guy two years ahead of me at the time who was a 3 out that I used to see in the gym. Stupidly, I never thought to take my basketball and a Sharpie and walk over him and say, dude, do you do me a really big favor? Can you just sign my basketball? Had I done that, I would have had a basketball signed by a future president of the United States of America. But who knew that that dude, Barry Obama, that I used to see playing ball in the gym, was going to become the president of the U.S.? I didn't know that. Not many people did. So maybe Barry Obama, when he was a 1L sitting in my chair, maybe he had his hand up wanting to be the first guy called on. I don't want to be the first guy called on. So everybody knows what you do if you don't want to be called on, right? Everybody knows what you don't do when you don't want to be called on. You don't make eye contact with the professor because that can make you look eager. So I am looking down at my notebook. I'm just going to write down the question. No way, no how, for no amount of money. Am I picking up my head to make eye contact? I don't want to be looking like an eager beaver, okay? Let him call anyone else. So he starts pacing across the room in this beautiful, august amphitheater on campus. He says, okay, who can tell me? What did the Smith Court say about non-mutual, defensive, collateral estoppel? And he stops, and I can see peripherally 
I'm in the second row, he's standing right in front of me, okay? So this could be bad, this may not end well, but I'm not looking up. He's okay, how about you, Mr. Jew? <laughs> You know the expression, the earth opens up underneath your feet. The earth opened up and I fell in. I can't believe it. He, that was all a, a, a trick. He, he calmed us down and then he didn't. That's, that's horrible. And that now he, he humiliates me because I'm wearing a yarmulke on my head. I can't believe this. And isn't that discrimination? Like, what, what if I was African American? He called me Mr. Black. Like, this is crazy. And in, in law school, I don't, think, like, I don't even remember what the question is. I'm having a complete meltdown. All of a sudden, the guy sitting directly in front of me starts answering the question. The Asian fellow in front of me, Thomas Jew, J O O. <laughs> so, full disclosure, I recall my sins today. Yes, for the two seconds it took Tom Jew, great guy by the way, to clear his throat and start answering the question, I absolutely was thinking to myself, "Why did I have to wear this on my head? I got, I'm from Philly. I got, I can wear my Phillies hat, my Sixers hat, my Flyers hat, my Eagles hat. Well, why did I have to wear my beanie on the first day?" I absolutely regretted my choice of being visibly Jewish in my chosen career for the first and last time. That was the only time I can point to where I regretted being visibly Jewish in the workplace. I have sat at my conference table and had potential clients say to me, hey, one second, before I sign up, I just want to check one thing. You're Jewish, right? Because I want a Jewish lawyer. I'm like, dude, I'm like the most Jewish lawyer in the city. Are you kidding me? What do you think this is, right? I have a friend who told me, he's a colleague, he lives out in, he is in Cleveland, and he often will get cases in like what he called, I don't know if I'm allowed to use this term nowadays, I'm just going to repeat the term he used, hillbilly areas, okay, rural, rural areas, let's call them that, to be a more politically correct term. So he, goes, so he goes out one time to sign up a case in this rural area from somebody who found him on the internet or through a, through a, through a yellow page ad or a TV ad, whatever it is, okay, and he gets to the house, he's wearing a yarmulke on his head, he walks in. And the guy has, I can't make this up, the guy has a swastika tattoo on his forehead, okay? So he's sitting there, okay? And he says to him, because he's quite a character, he says to him, you know, I just want to point something out to you before we go further. Like, I'm Jewish, are you sure you want to hire me? The guy goes, of course. He goes, I mean, listen, put aside, you know, our differences. He goes, of course I want a Jewish lawyer, okay? Time and again. The first time that I had a very significant case when I started doing personal injury losses, going back, I, I joined the, the family firm after going into big firm practice um, back in 1996. So several years, a few years into my practice, I had my first multi-million dollar case. We had a woman who made a turn. She, there were two fellows in Brooklyn who were double parked like everyone else in Brooklyn. They were loading or unloading their trunk and they were standing behind the car. And when she came around, she told the police officer that she thought she was hitting the brake, but she hit the accelerator. She hit them so hard that her car ended up underneath their car and she pinned them in between the two cars. So the other fellow got off bad, but my client got off worse. He ended up having 23 surgeries on his leg. It was just, he was crippled. So we moved forward in the litigation and I remember we went to a mediation to try to settle the case and they had offered $3 million and I turned it down. And I remember that well because I remember walking out doing the math because my fee is a contingent one. I only get paid if and when I'm successful and I get paid one third. So I quickly did the math and you know, noted in my head that I just turned down a million dollar fee, but it wasn't enough. So we went and proceeded to trial. Just before trial, the judge called everybody together at our last conference, pre-trial conference, and he said, listen, there's so much risk here, okay? If you guys point to the defendants are wrong, you may end up to pay him you know, a, a lot more than what you offered. And, you know, Mr. Rothenberg, if you're wrong, you know, your client who's very grievously injured may end up with less. I really think we should make another effort to settle this case. I want everybody here. I want all the attorneys, and I want all the adjusters. I'm going to set aside a day. We're going to have a settlement day. If we need to do it, we'll do a second day, which we ended up needing a second day. So one of the lawyers says, Your Honor, I, you know, my, my adjuster is, is in Kentucky. I mean, I, you know, I, I, you know I, I don't think I can get her here. He says, do you ever hear the thing? It's called a, uh, an airplane. Put her on an airplane, okay? I want everybody here in the courtroom. So we all, we're all there in the courtroom. And over the course of the first day, I think the offer went from, from my client from three to four, four something. We ended up eventually selling the case for six and a quarter million dollars. But after day one, when the offer was moving in the right direction, I'm walking out of court, and the defense attorney, the main defense attorney against whom I had been litigating for the last few years, we had developed a, a collegial relationship. He had noticed, because trial lawyers are very observant, and we notice everything, we're supposed to, that there were two people in the courtroom who were wearing yarmulkes on their heads. I was wearing one and the judge was wearing one. We were in Brooklyn, New York, and the judge was an Orthodox Jew. So we're walking out together, and Jim Baker, the Irishman, 
says to me, goes, as we're walking out of court, he goes, Rothenberg, I gotta tell you something. Had I known that the judge was gonna be wearing one of those beanies, I would have put one on also. <laughs> I said, Jim, that's the difference between me and you. I did my homework on this case. That's why I'm wearing this thing on my head all the time. There are other benefits. One of the other benefits is that it tells other people who you are. So for example, very early on in my career when I was still working in a, in a big law firm, uh, corporate law firm in New York, in Manhattan, I was working in a corporate deal and I realized I better remind the senior partner that I need to leave early on Friday. I don't want this to come as a surprise. So I went to his office on Tuesday or so, Wednesday, and I said, look, I'm working on the such and such deal. I just want to remind you I need to leave early Friday afternoon because I'm a Sabbath observer. And he said, oh, you know, thank you for letting me know. I said, just you know, in case you need to get coverage um, for the team. So he said, let me ask you something. Um, when does the Sabbath begin? I said, well, it's going to begin a little after 4 p.m. This is in the winter. And so I'm gonna to need to leave about 2 p.m. I need to leave myself a couple hours. You never know traffic in New York. I don't like to, you know, to, to change, get ready, uh, leave myself enough time in case, in case there any, any, uh, something comes up. So I, and he said, when does it end? I said, it takes about 25 hours. So it goes until an hour after sundown the next day. So it'll go until it'll end around five o'clock or a little after five o'clock Saturday night. I can come right back into the office, but I just wanted to let you know in case you needed coverage Friday night or during Saturday. He says, let me ask you a question. Suppose, I think, Based on my experience, this deal probably will conclude in the wee hours Friday night. Could you stay in the office until, say, 3 in the morning Friday night and finish the deal, and then we'll get you a car home. Let's say you get home at 4 a.m. Could you begin the Sabbath at 4 a.m. Friday night and then keep it until 5 a.m. Sunday morning because so you'll still have the 25 hours? Okay? I'm going to go here like five minutes. This is a very senior partner in a big Manhattan law firm. I'm thinking like, what am I going to tell them? Like, in the beginning, God created, okay? I was like, yeah, that's what I'm going to tell them. What else am I going to tell them? I said, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with the biblical story, how God created the world in six days, and then he rested on the seventh day. I said, so it's just, there are certain things that are negotiable. I said, this is not one of them. I, I, I have to rest. I have to begin the Sabbath at the sundown of the sixth day. And instantly his demeanor changed. He said, I am so sorry. I would never ask you to compromise your religious beliefs. I was just think, I was just thinking in like a creative way that you'd still be able to keep the Sabbath. I said, you don't have to apologize. It's an ingenious question. And if I had flexibility, look, well, sometimes there's flexibility, okay? I don't like having to go to a non-kosher restaurant and order an apple and a banana and a Diet Coke. I prefer going to a kosher restaurant. Thankfully, in Manhattan, there are kosher steakhouses, steakhouses that are at the level of the non-kosher one, so it's not a problem. If somebody refuses to go to a kosher place in Manhattan, that's just somebody being difficult. Okay? There are other cities where, in downtown Philadelphia, for example, where we have an office where I grew up and my parents still are, the, the most high-end dish that you can order, I actually, I'm not sure about this, it's a debate over which is the most high-end dish. Your choice is if you want to go out to a business lunch in Center City, Philadelphia, keeping kosher, you have a choice of falafel or soft pretzels. Okay? And that's it. You can't get sushi. You can't get a steak. You can't get a hamburger in Center City, Philadelphia. So in other cities, it's difficult. So if you have to, you can compromise. But this is something that wasn't, um, I wasn't able to compromise. I had a similar situation. Interestingly, sometimes it can be more difficult with somebody who's Jewish and sometimes more humorous. So a couple months after this incident with, this, with a senior partner in the corporate um, side, I was working with somebody in the litigation side, and I knew him pretty well, also somebody pretty senior, and he was kind of a character, happened to be a Jewish fellow, and I was at the holiday party you know, the Xmas party that they call the holiday party. And it was very nice. The firm got kosher food for me and the other, one other associate who kept kosher. There was a tiny little kosher section. So the, this other fellow, I was talking to him, or he came by, and he said, you know, Harry, do me a favor. He said, can you just hold my plate for a second? I just have to run to the restroom. So I, you know, reached out. And I, as I reached in for the plate, I noticed the following. There are very few foods that are recognizably not kosher. Shrimp is one of them. So I, I see his plate is filled. It's a plate of shrimp. So I, I, I recoil in horror. I pull my eye. I said, I'm so sorry. I can't hold your plate. So what are you talking about? I said, it, it, it's shrimp. It's not kosher. He says, Rolf, I'm not asking you to eat it. Just hold my plate while I go to the john. So now I have to explain to him the concept that here's the problem. Somebody else who's Jewish in the firm might see me holding a plate of shrimp. They'll say, oh, obviously it must be mock shrimp because otherwise Rothenberg wouldn't be eating it, so therefore I can eat it too. So I may unwittingly convince or persuade another Jew to eat something not good. He's like, okay, whatever, I get it. I'll find somebody else to hold my plate. That's fine, eventually understand. Much more importantly, it reminds you who you are in addition to reminding others or telling others. 
So I'll, I'll give you a couple stories on this, on this, you know, uh, one microscopic one, you know, everyday mundane one, and then a macroscopic one on a bigger issue on a bigger test. So here's the microscopic one, daily accounts. We um, have the waiting room in the office. Sometimes people have to end up spending hours in the waiting room. Why? Let's say a home health aide comes with their, her, 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 his or her charge and that person's being deposed. They're not in the room. They're waiting in our waiting room. Let's say a husband comes with a wife and, they, and the spouse waits while, they, while the spouse gets deposed. A, a parent with a child, a child with a parent, very often you have people sitting in our waiting room for an hour, two hours, three hours. So of course, even though nowadays everybody has you know, the world at their fingertips, I'm still old fashioned enough that I want to have waiting room material so they can pick up a magazine and take a look at the magazine. So we'll have you know, a couple of different choices. One of the choices is always Sports Illustrated, because I happen to be a very big fan of sports, so I like to get the Sports Illustrated weekly, so that the day comes when I get the mail, I can flip through it and read you know, one, maybe two articles while I eat my sushi lunch. So our receptionist opens all the mail, except for something more personal and confidential, she opens all the mail, she then sorts it into different piles for each different attorney, then she puts it all together with the tabs, and she brings it all to me because I want to see all the mail. You know why I want to see all the mail? Because I am a giant yenta. So I like to see everybody's business. It's not why I like to see the mail. The reason I like to see the mail is as follows. Maybe an injury that wasn't as serious became more serious. Wait, I didn't realize that person had another surgery. Maybe, this will happen often, the adjuster played games and only told us about the first $300,000 in coverage, and now they sent us a letter saying, oh, <clears throat> we, we, uh, we found in the cupboard there's an extra $5 million worth of coverage. I need to know that. That's a very different case now. Maybe a motion comes in where I've written a brief on that topic and I want to scribble a note to some one of the lawyers saying, see me, I have a brief that will be helpful on this. So I want to see what's going on in the office so I get all the mail, including Sports Illustrated. When it arrives, whatever day it arrives, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it's in the mail. One time of year, the receptionist knows. She does this surgical extraction. She takes that copy of Sports Illustrated out of the mail. It does not go to me. It goes to our non-Jewish filing clerk, he's from the Dominican Republic, that's his bonus, he gets that in addition to whatever financial bonus he gets at the, at the end of the year. So what does he get? He gets the famous best-selling swimsuit issue, <coughs> by far their best-selling issue, because she knows it doesn't go to me. Now if you'd stop and ask her, you know we noticed that every other week you always give Sports Illustrated to, to Harry, why don't you give him the swimsuit issue? She would say something like, well he doesn't want to see that, he's religious. And she is, tr I know this, that she has tremendous respect. How do I know that? Because often I'll do a lunch and learn in my office where we'll have a group come to the office and sometimes it's text-based. So what I'll do is I'll bring in a folio of the Talmud or, or some portions from the, from, the, from the Bible, from the Chumash, and I'll put little stickies on it. I'll say to her, do me a favor, make 25 copies of each of the pages you know, that I put the stickies on. When she returns those books to, me, to my office, it's like the Queen's Guard delivering an original copy of the Magna Carta. Like it's unbelievable reverence. She's incredible respect. It's a beautiful thing. I should have as much respect for the, for, for the books as she does. So she would say to you, he doesn't want to see that. He's religious. And she'd be 100% right. I do not want, I don't want to see the cover. I do not want to see that because I'm religious and I'm not supposed to look at those images. There's another reason though, and I know we're not that close to Vegas, but I'm going to invoke that rule. You know what, what we'll say what happens in Houston can stay in Houston. So if you ever happen to come across my wife, you don't have to tell her over this particular small section of this talk. The other reason that I don't want that issue in my office is that I really want to see it. There's a reason why that issue sells so many copies. Because men like to look at pictures of women not wearing bathing suits. It's very popular. And I know myself. If that issue makes it into my office, and my door closes, which it will at some point during the day. I'm going to have some phone call when I'm going to close my door. You give me 30 seconds. I won't just convince myself that it's okay to look at it. I will convince each of you with scholarly, persuasive argument that I have to look at it. You want to know why I have to look at that issue? I'm going to tell you why. Number one, Bar Raffaele is an Israeli supermodel. Okay? If she's not in that issue, that can be any sentence. i got to know about this. I mean, I speak all over the place. I have to know if Sports Illustrated is involved in anti-Semitism, number one. Number two, Gatex is an Israeli manufacturer of women's swimsuits. If there are no Gatex swimsuits in there, maybe Sports Illustrated is participating in BDS. I gotta know that also. I'll convince you, I'll convince me, and in five minutes, you know, I'm the litigation. So I wanna set up a safeguard so, she, so I tell her, I don't want it in my office. A, because I don't wanna see it. B, because I know I do wanna see it, and so I have to have a safeguard. That's the microscopic one. Here's a, here's a bigger issue. So, a number of years ago, 
there was a 42-year-old woman who was doing her nightly power walk in Manhattan. She was crossing Madison Avenue at 65th Street, and the little man turns white, which tells her that she can walk, so she starts walking. As she's walking, a bus is making a left turn. So the bus is coming from over her right shoulder. She has no chance. The bus makes the left turn, hits her, and kills her, and keeps going. Hit and run. The bus takes off. There's an eyewitness. There's a guy who saw it happen. And he tells the police officer, it was a blue and white bus. What company? Well, it's blue and white. What company? That's all we have, blue and white bus. In Manhattan, the following bus companies are blue and white. Well, the city of New York buses are blue and white. Bolt is blue and white. Greyhound's blue and white. Trailways is blue and white. Academy back then was blue and white. It was almost a rule, like you had to be blue and white if you're a bus company. I now represent her, or I represent her husband, I represent her estate. If we figure out which bus company that is, that case has enormous potential. Why? Because under New York law, this differs state to state, but under New York law, I can ask the jury for the following. I can say, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, no amount of money can give my client back what he lost. There's no amount of money who can give him back his wife, his beloved. But money is the only mechanism that's recognized under the laws of our country for compensation. And that's why, as mercenary as it sounds, and as difficult as it sounds, that's why I'm here, to ask you to award the appropriate amount of money to compensate him for his tragic loss. And these are what I could ask for. Number one, conscious pain and suffering, which there wasn't that much in this case. By the time the paramedics arrived, she was already dead. So it's not that significant. Loss of consortium, his loss of, of her consortium, that has some value. But the other thing I can ask for is called pecuniary loss. Pecuniary loss is a fancy word for money. I can ask for her lost wages. 42 years old, at the time she was working on a street, you may have heard of the street. It's a little obscure, but sometimes people have heard of it. It's in lower Manhattan, it's called Wall Street. Anybody ever hear of that street? <laughs> she was trading bonds on Wall Street, Wall Street making a million dollars a year. So I can ask the jury, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, she was 42 years old. Let's say she would have worked till 62, 20 years. I'm gonna ask you to award 20 years of the million dollars a year, putting aside the increases she would have gotten, the raises, promotions, fringe benefits, just, let's just use her base out a million dollars a year for 20 years, that's a $20 million case. And get you add on a million dollars for her pain and suffering, for the conscious pain and suffering, whatever limited amount she had, and for her husband's low consortium. So let's call it a $21 million case. If I figure out which bus company is it, and I don't care which one it is, because they'll have tons of coverage. Because usually when a bus gets into a fight with a person, the bus wins, pretty much always. So I just need to know which bus company, and this, here's the guy. He's the eyewitness. So of course, I sent person after person after investigator. He said, look, I don't know, I don't know, blue and white, I don't know anything, I don't know anything else. But I ask you, you've heard me speak for a little while now, don't you think that if I had gone to see him myself, I would have been persuasive enough? Don't you think I could have looked him in the eye and said, I represent her husband. They didn't have children. He, he, she was all he had in the world. They you're his only hope. The only way I can get him compensation is if you tell me which bus company. Don't you think I would have been able to persuade him to tell me which bus company? And the answer is, of course not. I'm not a trained interrogator. I sent a former state trooper, a former FBI guy. I sent people, that's what they do for a living. Professional investigators, interrogators. And he said, listen, I don't know. Whether he really didn't know or just didn't want to cooperate, I don't know. I have to believe he didn't know. Otherwise, why wouldn't he have told the police officer which bus company it was? He's like, I don't know. But suppose I had gone to him and I'd said to him, listen, I gotta ask you again. Isn't there anything that I could say to you? Isn't there anything I can do to help refresh your recollection? Isn't there anything that would help you remember which bus company is it? I mean, just really, if you just think, just think, just, was it Academy? Was it Trailways? Was it Graham? You tell me, how much money would have I had to stick in an envelope, how much cash, so that he would remember. You think $1,000? He didn't live in the best area in New York. $3,000, $5,000, you think for $10,000 and $100 bills in an envelope, he wouldn't have been willing to swear on a stack of Bibles. It was academy. Of course he would have. I'm looking at a $7 million fee. I get a third. $7 million fee for 10 grand. Anybody want that deal? You give me 10 grand, I'll give you back $7 million? Not bad, right? So of course that possibility crossed my mind. I had a friend very close friend with whom I do a lot of cases. And he said, you know what, I, I thought of a solution to the problem. We'll do the case together. I'll go talk to him. Meaning he was gonna go talk to him. And of course it was tempting. 
But at the end of the day, I said to myself the following. What happens when we get the depositions? And the lawyer for the other side, whichever bus company he names, says, can you just explain to me, you told the police officer it was a blue and white bus, but then you told Mr. Rothenberger, his investigator, that it was Academy bus. Like, what happened? Why the difference? So hopefully, he will say, because I paid good money for this testimony, oh, the police officer never asked me, or of course I told him, or I remembered afterwards it was Academy, or I saw a similar bus, and that's how I realized. But what if he has pangs of conscience and says, I cannot tell a lie. Mr. Rothenberg paid me $10,000, and, and that's why I said it was Academy. So number one, I'm going to get, maybe I'm going to get jailed, maybe. I'm certainly going to get suspended from practicing law. I'm going to lose my license. I'm certainly going to disgrace my firm's reputation. But worse, by far worse, I'm going to disgrace the Jewish people. Because yes, it is true, I wear this as a fashion accessory because black velvet matches any possible combination of suit, shirt, tie, belt, or suspenders, socks. There's nothing I've found yet where, the, where mm, that clash, it doesn't clash with anything. It goes great. That's one of the reasons I wear it. But the other reason I wear it is because of what it represents. So I want to share with you another story. Tell us about the bus. I'm sorry? Tell us about the bus. So we never found out which bus it was, and we ended up selling the case for $250,000 because that was the limits of her husband's auto policy for uninsured motorist coverage. And that was the end of that case. It was a shame. So I want to share with you another story that's a difficult one to tell over, but it's, uh, but it's an instructive one. It wasn't a Hebrew Academy offense, right? <laughs> no, definitely not. Back in the 1970s in Philadelphia, there was a radical group of African Americans called MOVE. I'm not sure how it started or why it started. They had, an apartment, they had a building, and they didn't let their kids go out to school. They didn't let anybody come into the building. They walked around, terrorized the neighborhood, wearing paramilitary gear, holding assault rifles, and it was very uncivil disobedience. So the Italian mayor of Philadelphia, Frank Rizzo, decided, we gotta do something about this. So he sent in a SWAT team. The SWAT team kicked in the front door and literally went door to door in hand-to-hand -hand combat and arrested all of them. There were few broken bones, there were a couple of lawsuits for brutality against the city, but that was it. It was the end of the move. Fast forward to the 1980s, and they're back. Someone decided, it's another different group, I don't know if it was nephews, cousins, or somebody you read about and say, oh, that sounds like a really good idea. They got another building, not letting the kids go out, not letting anybody come in, terrorizing the neighborhood, paramilitary gear, assault rifles. The difference now is that in the 80s, the mayor of Philadelphia is Wilson Good, who's black. And he realizes that area, that home where, where MOVE 2 is holed up, is right in the middle of his voting block. So not that MOVE was supported by the black community, but Wilson Good says, I don't think nowadays, right? I don't want pictures in the newspaper, in the Philadelphia Inquirer, of white cops you know, in full combat with blacks for any reason. So come up with a different idea. I am not sending in a SWAT team. So his cronies huddle, and they come up with this fantastic idea. We're going to take a helicopter. We're going to fill it with military explosives. We're gonna have it drop the explosives on the roof. It's gonna start a fire. When the building catches fire, hey, they may be crazy, but they're not suicidal. They will run out of the building. It is much easier to arrest someone who's running out of a burning building than it is to kick in the front door and go hand-to-hand -hand combat into rooms where they have assault rifles. So Wilson Good says, bless you, great, signs off on it, that's what they do, and it works to perfection. Helicopter, explosives, fire, they run out, the police tackle them, they arrest them, that's the end of them. But one tiny problem, the fire didn't get the memo, and the fire burnt down 60, 60 adjoining homes. At which point in time, Wilson Good is probably saying, why didn't I send in a SWAT team? So our Philadelphia office starts getting many, many, many calls. Some from people who were injured, some from people who lost their possessions, some from people who were injured and lost their possessions. And we decide, you know what? We typically would only take injury cases, not property loss cases. But if we handle so many of these, we can handle it as one case, it's worthwhile. So we sign up many of these cases, several dozen of these cases, and they get assigned to a young attorney for processing, along with his, with his assistant, his paralegal, who's a second year attorney who happens to be an observant Jew, and he's got the cases. And so he's charged with getting in touch with each of the clients, getting the medical records, along with his paralegal, getting proof. You can't just say, uh, I had in my living room a vase from the Ming Dynasty that was worth you know, $10 million. Like you gotta show receipts, pictures, something to try to prove what it is that you lost. So he's processing the case. It takes a long time. There are you know, 100 lawsuits against the city of Philadelphia. So we love all of our clients. Some of them we love even more. So one of our clients named Ernest Bostick, who had lost all of his worldly possessions in the fire because he, he had, was living with his girlfriend at the time. He's one of our clients and he's got a case and he'd call David once a week at least. When am I gonna get my money? And David would say, listen, Ernest, I told you, the case is gonna take probably two years. They got like 100 claims. 
And the city's not going to settle one at a time. We're going to go, and, and probably what will happen is as we get closer to trial, by then, after all the discovery, after the depositions, we'll end up settling the case. You've got to be patient. Next week, when am I getting my money? This is going on and on and on. Finally, one day, Bostic calls David, and he says, okay, settle my case. He says, what are you talking about? He says, yeah, I called the city hall, and I got the lawyer, city solicitor. They put me through to him, and I settled my case for 10 grand, 10 large. So, you know, get me my check. David says, who'd you speak to? He tells him the name, and sure enough, that's the name of David's adversary. It's the assistant city solicitor. So David says, I'll call him up. He calls him up. He says, hey, Dave from Rothenberg's office. He goes, you speak to my client, Ernest Bostick? The guy says, oh my, Dave, he's your client? He says, yeah, he's my client. He's, he called me directly. I thought he was pro se. Pro se is Latin for moron. Pro se is actually Latin for self-represented. That's the fellow who gets injured in an accident and figures he or she's gonna get more money on their own than hiring me. Good luck, really. I, I want to wish you the best of luck with that, okay? So some people did that. Why should I go pay a lawyer a third? I'll get the money on my own. So he figured, the guy from City Hall, the city solicitor, assistant city solicitor, figured since he's called me directly, he must be one of the self-represented people. He's not represented, obviously, otherwise I'd be hearing from his attorney. So he apologizes, we all know. Once somebody has an attorney, you can't talk to them. He says, I'm so sorry, I never should have spoken to him. I should have checked the list. David says, listen. It's, it's an honest mistake. He called you. It's fine. No harm. No foul. He said he settled his case with you for ten grand. Can I send you a release? He said, what are you talking about? I didn't settle the case with him. He said, he, I just got a phone with him. He said he settled his case with you for ten grand. He's just making that up. The guy says, oh, I don't believe this. We obviously had a miscommunication. Whenever I get a pro se person on the phone, I always say to them, what are you looking for so I can document the file? So I said to them, what are you looking for? So he said 10000 So I wrote it in the file. That doesn't mean I'm offering him 10000 So David says, look. We love all of our clients. We like some even more. Can I sell this one case with you? It was a misunderstanding. You spoke to him, you shouldn't have. Can you get authority, $10,000? He says, Dave, he says, you know, I guess I'm like low down on the totem pole. You know, I'm sure you have to go to superiors. There's no possible way. We're the city of Philadelphia. We've got 100 claims. I can't imagine if it got out that I settled one of them. It's not possible. In two years, you know what will happen. Wink, wink. We'll have a grid. We'll have a matrix. We'll have a chart. And we'll figure it all out. But I cannot settle one case. Dave said, there's no way to make exception. Absolutely not. So he has to call the nurse back and say, listen, I feel terrible. It was a miscommunication. He thought you were one of the self-represented people. He was just asking you, how much are you looking for? It's not a settled case. I pushed him. There's no way. As I told you many times before, you just got to be patient. Bostic hangs up the phone and says, oh, okay. In that case... I'll go kill the lawyer for the city. So he goes out and buys a gun with a sawed-off serial number, and he goes to City Hall, and he signs in at City Hall. They have the sign-in sheet later. Ernest Bostic in, 12, 10 p.m. So he's sitting in the City Hall waiting room. Now, City of Philadelphia, we think they're going to go fork over money for a Sports Illustrated subscription. They're cheapskates, right? So they got nothing, and he got no, you know, smartphone back, you know, in the 80s. So he's sitting there cooling his jets, waiting with a gun in his pocket, waiting to kill this guy. So apparently, like, how long are you going to wait? Like, what's going on? Sir, he's at lunch. Doesn't he know I'm here to kill him? So at 12.30, he gets impatient and he leaves. And what he says to himself, as he later explained to the police, was, I figured my lawyer's probably in cahoots with them anyway, so I'll just go kill him instead. So he comes to our office. And the elevator door opens on the floor where David works, because that's where he's heading. And it just so happens that David's walking past the elevator. So they make eye contact, they recognize each other, Bostic pulls the gun, David turns and starts running, and Bostic empties the gun. He shoots David six times in the back. He's got six entry wounds and six exit wounds. He collapses in a pool of blood. The police arrive before the paramedics, so my father's in the back of the police paddy wagon, literally holding David's head so it doesn't bang along the metal floor of the van. They rush him into surgery with the chief trauma surgeon in Philadelphia. 14 hours of microsurgery saves his life, and he's fine. I mean, of course, long period of convalescence, physically, mentally, my father reassured him, you have a job forever, whenever, however long it takes you. But he survived with no physical ill effects after a long period of convalescence. It was unbelievable. So at the time, I was about 18, and I said, you know, I'm going to go visit him. I mean, it took six bullets for fur. I mean, it's just crazy, and he lived, and it's the nice, right thing to do. So I went to visit him, and I think I was home maybe on Thanksgiving break. I'm not sure why I was home from college, but I was home. And I remember very vividly because when I went to, when I got to the room, his parents were there and they said, oh, Harry, thank you so much for coming. It was so nice of you. You know, do you mind, you know, just sitting with David? We just wanted to run out to get some food. I said, sure, that's why I came. So I'm sitting in this hospital room. It's just me and him. And he says, um, you know, he's very weak. He says, I have to tell you a story. This was two days after it happened. He said, I have to tell you a story. I said, no, you don't have to tell me anything. He's concerned with trying to get I have to tell you a story. I said, okay. He says, yesterday, which is the day after the surgery, the surgeon came to see me. He came into my hospital. 
and said, I want to introduce myself. I'm the surgeon who did the surgery for you. And he said, thank you so much. He goes, look, don't thank me. That's my job. He said, I don't ever do this. I said, what do you mean? He says, I do surgeries. He says, sometimes the patient doesn't make it. You know, they take them to the morgue. He says, other times they do make it, like you. Okay, thank God. I don't know if he said thank God, but they, they make it. And when they make it, they're followed by another doctor. As you've seen, I'm sure my, my colleague, Dr. So-and-so, is already coming to see you, right? Yes, of course. He's, he's going to be following you. I don't follow up on you. I'm just a trauma surgeon. I just do the surgeries, and then that's it. I never see the patient again. But I'm breaking my rule because I had to see you. Because I've never seen anything like your case before. I've been doing trauma surgeries for 25 years, and I have seen everything. I've seen shootings like yours. I've seen beatings. I've seen drownings. I've seen electrocutions. I've seen everything you could possibly imagine. You took six bullets. One of them grazed your heart. One of them grazed your spinal cord. Others grazed other major organs. If they were any closer, you'd have been dead or paralyzed. I mean, any closer. If you had done anything differently that day, if you had turned differently, if you were wearing heavier or lighter clothing, that would have changed the trajectory. Anything different, you would have been dead or paralyzed. I've never seen anything like this before, so I just wanted to come and say hello to you and tell you, you should know you had a guardian angel watching over you. There was many left. I was like, wow. He says, but there's more to the story, but I didn't tell it to him because he's not Jewish. I want to tell it to you. I said, yeah. He says, that morning, I left my house, and I got into my car. Um, when I tell the story over at college students, I have to explain this, but I can see from the audience, there'll be people here that understand this. You remember back in the day, in order to start a car, you would actually take something called the key and like put it into the ignition and then twist it, okay? You know, now you just get in your car and you say, you know, Scotty, start engine, okay? So he says, I put the key in, and I turned it on, and I put the car in drive, and I, and I put my seatbelt on, and I was about to drive away, and all of a sudden, I said to myself, wait a minute, did I put my tzitzes on today? He goes, and I went like this, and I checked, and I wasn't wearing my tzitzes. He says, so I said to myself, Dave, you can go to work one day without your tzitzes on, okay? He says, so again, I started to put my phone on the accelerator, I'm going to drive away, and I said to myself, Dave, how can you go to work without your tzitzes on? He says, I put the car back in park, I turned it off, I took my seatbelt off, I went into my house, I went upstairs, and I took off my coat, took off my jacket, took off my tie, unbuttoned my shirt, and took it off, and I put on my heavy wool pair of scissors, put my shirt back on, my tie back on, my jacket back on, my coat back on, and I went to work, okay? So I'm, I'm listening to the story with my jaw on the floor. I can say pretty safely that at the time I'm listening to the story when I'm about 18, I was not wearing my scissors. I can say pretty safely that since then, unless I'm in the swimming pool or the shower, I'm wearing my scissors. <laughs> and he felt that he had done something extra for God, and God did something extra for him later that day. So I told the story over a number of years ago on a college campus. I think it was at NYU, I'm not, I'm not sure. And afterwards, I said, any questions? And a guy raised his hand, and he said, I'm rabbi. I said, I'm not a rabbi. I said, okay, um, whatever you are. Um, he said, um, I have a question for you. I said, great. You can see he was a little uncomfortable. I said, let's go, fire away. He says, you know you told that story about the guy who got shot? Yeah. And it sounded like you were saying, like, you know, like God protected him because he did something extra for God. I said, yeah. He said, well, how do you know Maybe if he hadn't gone back in his house, his whole day would have been like five or ten minutes ahead. So he wouldn't have been walking past the elevator. So maybe by going back and putting that garment on, maybe that's what got him shot, not what saved him. Mm -hmm. I said, that's a breathtaking question. Let me ask you one in response. How do you know you're not 100% right? And if he hadn't put his scissors back on, he would have been in his office, sitting at his desk, which is where Bostic was headed. And Bostic would have gotten off the elevator. Instead of shooting him in the hallway where at least he was able to turn and start to run and get shot in the back, he would have walked up to him, pointed the gun at point blank range, shot him in the face, the heart, kill and kill. See, you don't know, and I don't know. We have a rule in Judaism that goes as follows. Let's imagine you head to your local torch, and that evening the rabbi is giving a or the Rebbe is giving a class teaching you about Lushan Hara, the prohibition against saying something negative about someone else. Often when people learn about this, they'll say, well, what do you mean? But what if it's true? If it's not true, that's a whole other prohibition. That's Motsi Shemra. Of course you can't say something negative that's false about someone. Of course not. But unlike in America, where truth is a defense, the defamation or libel or slander, you know, somebody sues you because you said something terrible about them and you damaged your reputation, you can defend by saying, but it's true. In Judaism, that's not a defense. You can't say something negative about someone else, with very rare exceptions. Yes, if you've been swindled by someone and someone comes and says to you, should I do business with that guy? You can say to them, listen, let me just tell you about what happened to me. Okay, you ask your local Orthodox rabbi. So imagine you've just heard, you've, you've just gone to this class, you've learned about the prohibition, you're not supposed to say something negative about nobody else, 
ixne on the gossip. You then go out to dinner with a fellow person who was in the class. And you sit down at dinner, and you order you know, soup and a main, and you're, the person who you're with who was at the class says to you, oh, did you hear what happened to so-and-so? And tells you this incredibly juicy bit of terribly negative information, gossip about someone else, okay? And you're thinking, I can't believe it. We just studied in the class. Okay, fine, you know, whatever. That doesn't mean that you know somebody takes a class and learns about the kosher laws that, that immediately they start keeping kosher. Okay, he listened to the class and whatever. He wants to share this juicy bit of gossip. But imagine immediately thereafter, the person who just shared the gossip with you takes his first spoonful of soup, puts it to his lips, but forgets to blow on it and doesn't realize the harm. It's like, ah! Oh! We've all done that, right? Burns off, you know, eight layers of, of his skin on his tongue, okay? And it's like, ah, oh my God, it's water, okay? He's freaking out. You are not supposed to save that person. <laughs> Lushan Hara, the big guy got you, the rabbi's right. You know why God did something with someone else? Of course you don't know why God did something with someone else. But the person to whom it happened is of course supposed to say, okay, that was a little freaky. I'm gonna think about this one. Of course you're supposed to think about it. And is it crazy, is it crazy to think like that? So for example, let's imagine that you're a student. So you're on campus. We've all either probably been there, or maybe we have kids or friends, etc., who are on campus. So when I wear a knapsack, that, had, that, that unless it has virtually nothing in it, once it's got you know at least halfway full, and certainly if it's full, much to my kids' chagrin, because they'll tell you that you know their father's a big dork, I wear it over both shoulders, which is very uncool. But it protects me against spinal S curvature, and I'm sensitive to that as a personal injury attorney. I know bad for your spine if you wear it the cool way over one shoulder. But most people wear it over one shoulder. You could stuff it. Go try to get a teenager to wear it over both shoulders. You could put, you know, lead in there. They're going to wear it over one shoulder, okay? So imagine you're walking on your campus. Somebody's got this overstuffed backpack. And now they're texting. They're not paying attention. And as they walk by, they hit you with the backpack. Or maybe with their roller bag in an airport. And they knock you over, okay? You fall down to the ground. You get up. You turn around. And the person who knocked you down looks at you and is like, got a problem? Now, I don't know about you, but I know about me. That's a fist fight. That is instant. You knock me down because you're not paying attention, and then you mouth off to me, you get impounded, okay? So now imagine you go to your class or your meeting, and now you're walking back, and now some other knucklehead's not paying attention, texting, and they're you know, wheeling their wheelie bag, or they've got their overstuffed knapsack, and they knock you down to the ground. And as you're falling, you're like, what's going on today? And so this time, as you jump up, you already have your fists clenched. You're ready this time, right? Except this time, the person who knocked you down turns around and says, I'm so sorry, I feel terrible, I'm such a klutz, I should have been paying attention. Can, can I help you out? What's your reaction going to be? At most, you'll say, just be a little more careful next time. At most, you might even say, hey, it's, you know, it's fine, you know, don't worry about it, it was an accident. You walk away. So if somebody watched these two scenes in a silent movie, they didn't hear the interaction. All they saw was you got knocked down once, got up, pounded the fellow. Second time you got knocked down, got up, no problem, you walk away. Schizophrenia, like what's going on? And the answer is simple. You're mirroring. The first person was aching for a breaking, cruising for a bruising, so you gave it to him or her. The second person acted perfectly appropriate, appropriately, so you just mirrored that. So I always wonder, I don't know how God works, but I wonder, is it possible? I have clients, this will happen all the time. I have clients who go in for surgeries that are horrifying. Pins and plates and screws and rods, and look at the x-ray, sometimes it looks like an erector set. I was sitting recently, I've known this a long time, 20 years now. I was sitting recently looking at a surgery that a fellow had done, brain surgery. So in order to do brain surgery, not to get too graphic, but they have to get to the brain. So in order to get to the brain, they have to go through the skull. So the doctor, I'm, I'm reading the operative report. The doctor talks about how he used a harpoon. Like, a harpoon? That's what they used to kill whales. The doctor put a harpoon through this guy, poor guy's head? Horrifying. So I'll have clients, often by the time they get to me, they've already had the surgeries, but often, just as often, they need surgeries after they get to me. They may have an initial one, or it's scheduled, and they hired me. So they'll have a big surgery coming up. I was thinking of sometimes where they, they're gonna cut the leg and they're gonna twist the bone and they're gonna be in an external fixator for the next three months, like scary surgeries. So very often I would have clients, non-Jewish clients, Jewish clients, non-observant Jewish clients, observant Jewish clients, and they'll say to me, you're religious, right? Yeah. You know I'm having that big surgery tomorrow? Yes, could you please pray for me? Absolutely. So if somebody's Jewish, I'll say, what's your Hebrew name? Absolutely. And I'll say, you should pray too. So sometimes somebody will say to me, you know, I don't really know how to pray. I said, you don't, know how to, you don't have to know how to pray. Just pray in whatever language. You know, pray in English, okay? You know, God's up there. You know, I've never prayed before. Fine. First time for everything. But I always wonder, when that person, if they take that advice and they pray for the first time, which they should. If you, ever, if you haven't ever prayed, pray. The earlier you start, the better. 
But I wonder, when God hears that prayer, he's saying like, I'm so sorry. You know, the person's 40, 50, 60, 70. God's saying, I'm so, have we met? I don't, I don't remember if we've ever been introduced, right? Versus the guy who's sitting in his car, all dressed, and says, I gotta go to work without my senses on. And God's up there going to the angels, by the way, I know something's you know, supposed to happen later today. I got this guy. I got, the, I got this one myself. So I wonder if he doesn't sometimes act the same way, mirroring reciprocally the way we treated him. So I'm going to stop here. I am happy to take questions um, about the NBA playoffs, uh, which I have more than a passing interest, about Judaism, about uh, lawyering, uh, or about whatever else you'd like to ask about. Uh, and also, I do, um, as the Rav mentioned, um, I do a weekly video. It's much shorter than this. It's, we try we keep it under five minutes. I'd say on average it's about four minutes long. It's easy to get. You can either, if somebody has a piece of paper, you just if you write down your email address, I'll happily add you. Or you can go on YouTube, just search Harry's Video Blog, and you can subscribe that way. Um, or I have cards. I don't have enough for everybody, but I have a few. Somebody can send it around, and you can send me an email. I'm happy to uh, to add you. So, assuming we have time for questions, do we have time for them? any questions? Nobody wants to talk about the NBA playoffs. Um, Where is Dave now? Still working for so firm. Dave came back two different times, um, he, and now he is in another city. So he is not working with the um, he's not working with the firm now. But if he called tomorrow and asked my dad, you know, can I come back? The answer is is always a yes. Um, and thank God, you know, he keep uh, his senses. I'm sorry. Did he keep his senses with the bullet holes? Did he keep them? I don't know the answer to that. My guess would be from my own experience um, with clients who who have gone through similar situations, not typically shootings is usually the clothing gets cut off. That's the standard protocol, and it's usually gone. You know, sometimes they'll, they'll leave it in the bag, but usually not, because usually it's just in, you know, in pieces. Um, whenever it's there, we always tell the clients, please keep it, because we want it for evidence in front of the jury. You know, it's, it's, it can often be very powerful evidence in a serious injury case. So I don't know, I don't know if he still has it. Where did Bostic? So Bostic was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Um, he served all 25 years. Uh, every year, David sent a letter into the parole board talking about how terrified he was and about how it had altered his life. Um, none, none of it for the positive, and about how he respectfully requested the court to to the judge or the parole board to make sure that he served his full sentence, um, and he did. Uh, David was very worried when he got out after 25 years uh, that maybe he'd come after him, but thankfully things were quiet and he didn't. Uh, so he did serve the full sentence. Did he ever get his 10,000? Um, I have no idea what happened in this case. Nobody ever asked me that before. I have no clue. I'm going to guess that we moved to be relieved as counsel on that case. I'm going to guess that. And I'm also going to guess that no other lawyer picked up that case. Whether he continued pro se from jail, I don't know. But I'm pretty sure he would have been a toxic client for, for, for anyone. So I'm going to guess no, that he did not get it. Just my guess. Educated guess. Yes. How do, you, how do you go to do the blogs and the Jewish part and or the movie part? Mm -hmm. How do you reach the movie to go with your parasha? How do I how do I figure out the movie? Yeah. Okay. So um, whenever my wife is around, somebody asks me that. I jokingly say, you know, she you know chooses all the movies and she rolls her eyes, okay, because she definitely does not choose all the movies. So some of them uh, are movies that I saw in my wayward youth. And I didn't know at the time that I was watching those movies that I thought I was just watching for entertainment, but really I was watching so that someday when I needed a movie clip, I'd be able to remember, oh yeah, there's a scene in that movie that I saw when I was 15, 18, 20, 22, 25, whatever, and I can use it. So often they're ones that are just stuck in the back of my head and I can go back and find them. Other times, thankfully, through the magic of the internet and particularly YouTube, uh, I'm able to search on a particular topic. So often I'll find things that I haven't seen, but they just, you know, they'll, they'll fit in. Um, and then other times, you know, because I have people who enjoy the videos, people will send me like, oh, you have to see this great scene, figure out a way to work it into a video. And so, you know, it's usually the other way around. Almost, thankfully, almost always. Usually I, I know the point that I want to make about the total portion of the week or about the holiday, and then I go looking for a video. It's not that often that I'll see a great scene and say, oh, I have to come up with a total way to work around that. But if it's an exceptionally great scene, I can't tell you that I've never done that. It is possible that I have come up with something. But the Torah right. part in your life had those... So how do I come up with those? Yes. So, so um, I would say from an unlimited number of sources. Um, I can't even count the number of sources, which means um, some of them are from um, my rabbi, um, who I had the pleasure of studying with for a couple of years. He, he died very young, Rabbi Uziel Malevsky. Um, so some of the things that I study with him. Uh, some of the things that I study with my current producers, my current study partners. Um, some of the things that I find, because usually what I'll do is I'll pick a topic, and then after I pick the topic, 
I'll try to find everything, not everything, that's impossible, but as much as I can that's been written by the commentators on that topic. So I'll literally go to the local synagogue and just pull volumes off the shelf to try to find every commentator who's spoken on that particular passage. Um, other times I'll meet people and they'll tell me something, or I'll be in a class and I'll hear something, or some story will happen to me, and that's how it will come up. So it's really, it, it, you know, there, there's every possible way that you can imagine um, that I come across something or hear something or, or, or live through something uh, that I think is worth sharing. Yeah. LeBron James in his prime against Ben Simmons. LeBron James in his prime against Ben Simmons. So the disadvantage, so I'm going to give Simmons the height advantage. Um, the problem is that, that James in his prime has a jump shot that at times is lethal, and Simmons has not yet shown any signs of a jump shot. So i got to figure that that one's going to go to LeBron. But if you ask me that in five years, I don't know. We'll see. Um, and, and look, I would say the, the, this also, that LeBron, you're talking about one of the three best players to ever play. I say three because it would be disrespectful to my father if I didn't say three, because my father will argue till the cows come home that Will Chamberlain is the greatest player ever. Younger people will say it's Michael Jordan, and there are people nowadays that are starting to say, or have been saying for a while now, that it's LeBron James. So Simmons in his rookie year, I'm not yet ready to anoint him as the next one, but I'm certainly excited to, uh, to continue to watch. Uh, particularly because we, we, my firm is in a partnership now. We advertise with the 76ers. So we sponsor this very, very nice uh, charitable endeavor wherein they'll honor before certain games, 20 games or so a year, so half the home games, they honor a child who was very sick and then you know, came out of it um, or has a you know, fighting chance, and they bring them to the game. So one of us will go onto the court, for example, I did this a couple times, and I met you know, a, a, a young girl who suffered from leukemia. It was her first time out of the house in two years. So she comes, they bring her to center court. I met her, and then one of the Sixers surprises her and comes over and says hello and gives her a, you know, a jersey with her name on it. It's a very nice, uh, I mean, look, we do it for marketing purposes, but it happens to be a genuinely nice thing. It's very nice to meet the, the family. They're very excited about that. Rockets for the championship? Um, I think you have more than a puncher's chance. But the longer Steph Curry is on the shelf, the better your chances. <laughs> yeah. How is Harry towards you? I'm sorry? How is Barry towards you? How was he towards me? So we, so here was the only thing that I can't remember. I know we we played in the gym, and I know we played pickup together. I cannot remember whether he was on the team. We only were there one year together, so we had a team with which we were big, we had a big rivalry in the playoffs that happened to be a mostly black team, and we were a mostly Jewish team. Although we did have a, you know, it wasn't a fully Jewish team, um, and so they were our big rivals all three years that team. And we had turnover because some people graduated, and they had turnover. I cannot remember whether he played on that team. I just don't remember. Because it wasn't of note back then. Had I known that, somebody said to me, he's going to be the president of the U.S. I would have, of course, had somebody standing there, I would have told my wife, please come to the game and take pictures of me playing against. But I just, who knew? I had no idea. He was a good basketball player. What age did you become observant? So I grew up in an observant household, um, but we certainly got m more serious as we as, we, as the family um, grew. My father had a rule. It's a very interesting rule. The house has to accommodate its most religious member. The most religious member in the house has to be comfortable in the house. So I'll give you an example of how that played out. My sister, who at the, for many years was the most observant member in the household, when she was about 12, she had a rabbi who was very inspiring to her, and he was her guru. So if he said something, that was it. So she came home one day and said to my parents, my rabbi said that we can't eat any longer from Brooklyn Bagels because the supervision is suspect. So we can no longer eat from Brooklyn Bagels. So my father made an announcement, we will no longer have Brooklyn Bagels in this house, can't have it because, you know, my sister, she doesn't want it. So the other people in the house, you know, the other siblings, particularly the older siblings, went crazy, what, 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 what do you mean? Brooklyn Bagels wasn't just, we can't eat Brooklyn Bagels. Brooklyn Bagels was the only kosher bagel store in the city of Philadelphia. So no Brooklyn bagels meant no bagels in the house. I'm 17, she's five years younger than me, 16, okay, whatever, right? And I can't have a bagel now because my younger sister's rabbi decided that the bagel store, that's kosher, it's such a huge letter, it's kosher, there's a rabbi in there. He decided that you can't trust the bagels, but that was my father's rule. So that was it, no more bagels in the house. Now I was 17 and I had a car, or I had access to a car, usually I shared it with my sister. So what I would do was I would drive the bagel store and then I would get the bagels and I would have them in a brown bag and I would put them in my knapsack that at the time I probably did have over one shoulder because you know I was a cool teenager. And then I would bring them in and I would go downstairs and I'd keep them in my room. And in the morning, what would happen is early in the morning, there'd be a knock on the door. Yeah, who is it? It's mom. 
Mom, why are you knocking my door? Uh, can I get a cinnamon raisin and a sesame? <laughs> okay, Mom, I'll be right there. Okay. So, don't tell this story to my father. I never told him this story. It's my mother's, it's my mother's, uh, my mother's little secret. So, but he had that rule. It was a very interesting rule. And then, so, and there were certain things that I thought were crazy. Then, when I later went to Israel, um, and I no longer thought were so crazy, and that had a good effect on my younger siblings. So it was a process, but there, but there was never a time where, where you know, it was, it was an observant home. It was a traditional home. It was, it was always a kosher home. I wore my yarmulke. I did get much more serious about many things after I went to, to Israel when I was 21 after college. How long did you spend in Israel? I spent two years there before law school, and then, okay, I have to be honest here. There's, there's one year of my life that I don't include in my biography because it's not a pleasant one. Um, I went to Israel during my junior year in college to go to yeshiva, and I made a bad choice of yeshivas, and I lasted there a few months before they, I'm going to put this delicately, asked me to leave. I was forcibly relocated, so I switched to Barlan and spent the rest of the year on the beach. So that year did not work out well, but I was in Israel that year. Um, I had a lot of fun that year. None of it was, was, was religious, or very little of it. But then after college, I had spent two years at Rosanath, and then after law school, went back married with our first two kids, and that's when I started, in addition to studying, that's when I started teaching. Uh, that year in between law school and, and starting work, I deferred my job in Manhattan for a year. I went back for a year. Somebody else had a hand up? Yeah. Yeah. In your personal life, did you experience like a miracle from God that you saw, that you believe is true story, that God does miracles? <laughs> um, so the answer is, uh, very personal, and it's absolutely, uh, it's a yes, and what you'll have to do is, you'll have to invite me to come back another time to tell you that story, because it takes time to tell, um, but yes, most definitely, um, in, a, in a very uh, profound way, uh, involving uh, one of our children who had a, um, a near-death experience. Um, that was not pleasant, but thank God he's, you know, he's doing well, and yes, we certainly, without question in my mind, saw the hand of God during that story. Um, do you remember what I'm talking about? If I told you, you'll, you'll remember. But, uh, oh, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. She so knows? She knows, yes. She doesn't know the whole story, but, know. but she knows what happened. Can you still fly I'm sorry? <laughs> <laughs> was there any specific, in, well, maybe this is the answer. I was going to ask you, was there any specific incident that made you want to be more observant than get more religious? So it wasn't a particular incident, but it was a certain approach. So what I mentioned about Ursamech is, I arrived at Ursamech, I'm 21 years old, and I've been to day school. So I know a lot of the, a lot. it's not like I'm, I'm hearing about kosher for the first time, or Shabbos for the first time. I just, you know, whatever I did, I did it half-heartedly. You know, like if there was a big game on, on Shabbos, I would never turn the TV on, on Shabbos. I would just leave it on, you know, Friday afternoon, so that it would be tuned to that channel, so that, you know, that night or the next day I could watch the game, okay? So it was, you know, Shabbos light. So when I got to her Samach, the Durham counselor took me and my roommate. I went with another friend who from college who was of a similar level of, you know, Jew-ishness. So we're all walking into the door. And he says to us, um, okay, you don't want to go over the rules. So I no doubt if you had a video on my face, I would have rolled my eyes. Without any question. Oh, here we go. Okay, next three hours, 800 rules. He's okay, uh, no girls and no drugs. And on Shabbat and on, on, on the holidays, please don't turn any lights on or off because there are people who are, who are observing and they wouldn't be able to, you know, like, you know, in the common areas and they wouldn't be able to, you know, to, to change that, okay? I said, what do you mean? What about the other 400 rules? He said, what do you mean? I said, listen, dude, I went to day school. I know there are like, you know, hundreds of other rules. There are like 613, right? How could this be the only rules? He said, let me, let me ask you something. He says, if we forced you to do something here, do you think there's any chance you would keep doing it when you left? I said, no, of course not. He said, why would we force you to do anything? He says, you're here, you're a big boy. First time anybody ever said that to me before with respect to my Judaism. And you're gonna, you have questions, you know, probably, and we may have answers, you may like them, you may not, but you're here to explore, you're gonna make your own decisions. So that approach was completely different than the approach of, for example, this is a very painful memory, you know, to, to the extent of why I probably wasn't wearing tzitzit when I was 18. The rabbis in my school, when I was 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, would come over, and in the guise of a friendly, fatherly, avuncular gesture, would go like this, and kind of like, you know, massage your shoulder. But what they were doing was checking whether you were wearing tzitzis, okay? And I really, really didn't like that. Because I felt, you know what? Whether I should or shouldn't, I'm more sure about one thing. That's between me and the guy upstairs. I don't have the answer to you. And that drove me crazy. 
Um, you know, I'd get in trouble, for example, one of the reasons that I was you know, thrown out of yeshiva when I was 18, I would get in trouble because I would come late to, you know, to prayers. Hey, maybe I got a problem with him, not with you. And, and so, and that was a sea change, the way I was treated at Or Sameach, where it was, of course, it's between you and him, you're going to make your own decisions. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I, like I said, I have some cards. I don't have enough for everybody, but, but if you can, you know, share. Thank you very much. And if you have, you have a piece of paper and a pen, if anybody wants to give me your email address, I'm happy to.